Okay, so I'm going to give you a hypothetical situation where we're going to be working with two variables. And those two variables are going to be HIV status and whether a person is a IV drug user or not an IV drug user. So we got two variables, HIV status, drug user, right? Well, IV drug user. Both of those are yes and no, true or false, yes and no, right? Only two possible outcomes there. That makes them not a numerical variable, but a categorical variable. Yes or no, HIV, uh, have HIV. Yes or no, they use uh, uh, intravenous drugs. Right? So you got, you got two variables, each variable, has two categories, two values that it could be. Okay, we're going to set that this up as a table. We're going to go through these steps. Okay, the first step we're going to go to is uh, we're going to take we're going to take a random sample of patients in a community healthcare facility that that go to a community health facility. Maybe there's ten to that ten thousand patients that use this facility on a regular basis, but we're going to randomly select two hundred of them. Okay, and we find that out of those 200, 40 patients are HIV positive. It happens to be in a population neighborhood where there's a lot of HIV positive patients, right? So what's the prevalence of HIV in this population? Remember, randomly sampled 200 people, we can guess at the prevalence from that, right? What do you think is the prevalence of positive, right? 40 people out of 200, what's the prevalence? Well, actually, it's going to be 20%, 40 out of 200, 40 over 200 is 20%, right? If it had been 20 out of 200, 20 out of 100, it would have been, uh, 40 out of 100 would have been 40%, 20 out of 200, 40 out of 200 is 20%. I'm confusing myself here. Okay, that's our prevalence. Okay, so now we notice that in this same sample of 200, of 200 people, right, who were randomly sampled, some of them are IV drug users, and some of them are not IV drug users, right? So it turns out that 50 of these people are IV drug users, 50 people. I haven't noticed whether or not they're IV positive, HIV positive or not, but 50 of them are IV drug users, and 150 have never used IV drugs out of the 200 sample that we have. Okay, so I want to summarize this into a table. I want that table to be a contingency table, similar to the way we used to uh, uh, set up a table for a, a drug, for a uh, testing, a diagnostic test, evaluating a diagnostic test. I'm going to put in the rows, I'm going to put the exposure. Is the person an IV drug user or not an IV drug, drug user? In the columns, I'm going to put the outcome, like remember, ill or not ill, like uh, just like in a diagnostic test, ill or not ill. Right? In other words, HIV positive or not HIV positive in the columns. And then I'm going to assign each person of these 200 people to one of those boxes. And there's four possibilities. HIV positive, IV drug user. HIV negative, IV drug user. HIV ne positive, not an I IV drug user. HIV neg negative, and, uh, or whatever. You know, there's four combinations. I lost track. Of, you know. So anyway, so this table is going to look something like this. Right? Notice that if I go across here, uses IV drugs, doesn't use IV drugs. We already noticed that there were 50 people that were IV drug users, 150 who didn't use IV drugs. We also noticed that there's 40 people that are HIV positive, and there, there are 160 people that are HIV negative. So the exposure is in the rows. The out the disease is in the columns. The other thing that I like to do, I'm always going to set it up that way because it's going to work out a little easier, especially if you're doing this analysis in SPSS. Rather than put, I, you know, uh, uh, Levi mentioned that there's other ways you can look at this, for instance, uh, uh, whether a person is HIV positive or not, whether or not they're a drug user, so I can reverse these tables. It's going to work out a little bit better if you put teeth, stick the exposure in the rows and the, and the disease or no disease in the columns. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put it, I'm going to try and code it. So the, the, top, the, the top row is people who have the exposure, and the left column is people who have the disease. Right? And we can do that in SPSS pretty easily because SPSS organizes these tables alphabetically. It actually uses ASCII numbers, computer's version of alphabetical. 
So in other words, if I want uh, if I want IV drug users to be in the top row and not not IV drug users to be not uh, in other words not exposed or not IV drug users to be in the bottom row, I would code the IV drug users with the number one, and I would code the IV not drug users uh, with the number two, so they'd be in the bottom row. That's the way it works. Same thing with the disease. I might make people who have the disease zero, and people who don't have the disease, I might code with number one, just so it organizes like that. Okay. So, okay, so now that's, this is what I know about this. So now I go back and take a closer look at the actual individual people in this study. Okay, so again, what's the prevalence of HIV? It's, uh, it's uh, uh, 20%. So in this bottom column, in this bottom row down here, where we add up the totals, we know that 40 people have HIV, 60 pe uh, 160 people do not, uh, not HIV positive, right? So our prevalence is 40%. Okay, so now if you knew, if there is no association between IV drug use and being HIV positive, in other words, maybe it's something else, maybe instead of IV drug use, we were looking at left-handed or right-handed, right? Just another another different exposure. Left-handed, your extensive exposure, not left-handed, no exposure. Instead of drug use, just think of it that way. What would we expect this table to look like if IV drug use had nothing to do with being HIV positive? Well, we would expect people that are in the top row to be HIV positive at the same rate, prevalence or rate, as people in the bottom row who have no exposure. Right, so how would we calculate that? Well, there's 50 people that we know use, uh, that use IV drugs. So we would expect 20% of them to be HIV positive. So 20% of 50 is 10 people. We would expect 10 people to be in that top left row. And that would be 40 people to be in the next row. Right? Well, out of 150 people, if there was no, if everybody was getting at the same rate, out of 150 people who did not use IV drugs were to get the disease, were, were, um, uh, we would look at them, what would we expect in terms of their HIV status if IV drug use had nothing to do with it? We would expect they'd get it at the same rate everybody did, 20%, right? So 20% of 150 is 30 people. So we expect 30 people here, and we would expect 120 people in the next box. Right? And that would look something like this right that's what our table would be what it would look like this indicates that if you're an iv drug user the chances of you having uh, uh, uh hiv are 10 out of uh, 10 over 50 20 percent and if you're not an iv drug user the chances of you being hiv positive are 30 out of 150 or 20 percent both at the same rate same prevalence for the overall population okay so now this is what we would call our expected values. If there's no association between IV drug use and, and um, uh, 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 being HIV positive, this is what we would expect this to look like. If we actually did it and there was no association, we might not get exactly this, but we get something close to it. We might get 10, we might get 9 and 41 or 12 and 38. You know, we might not get exactly this, you know, the statistics, we're taking random people here. So even if it's true, we wouldn't exactly get this outcome, but we expect to get pretty close to this outcome, right? Maybe not exactly, but pretty close to it. Okay, so now let's take the actual people in this study and go back and look, each individual, are they IV, HIV positive, are they drug users, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that in fact, that's the real observed values. In fact, 15 out of the 50 people who use IV drugs were HIV positive, and 25 out of 150 people who did not use HIV drug use turned out to be HIV positive. So it's a little bit different. But you know, it's not all that different, but it is different. The question now becomes, how different do our observed values have to be from our expected values for us to say with less than 5% chance of being wrong that there's an association between HIV and drug use, IV drug use. How different it is, is this different enough for us to have less than 5% chance we would get this result just by chance, even though there's no association. 
That's what we're anchored here. So what does that make our null and alternative hypothesis when we do a type squared test? It makes us say that our null hypothesis is that there's no association between IV drug use and HIV status, right? There's no, no, no association. Our alternative hypothesis is there is an association between IV drug use and HIV status. And how are we gonna prove that? We're gonna prove that by demonstrating whether or not there's a big enough difference between our expected values and what the actual people, where they actually wound up. 15 people were IV drug users and HIV positive, 35 were uh, drug users IV negative, and 25 and 120. That's the way they really turned out to be, right? So we need to compare these two. And we're gonna use a test, we're gonna use several tests. We're gonna look at chi-square, we're gonna look at odds ratio, and we're gonna look at relative risk. Each one of them is a tool to evaluate these differences in these two tables. Okay, so let's, let's take advantage of that tool. Okay. Okay, it's just a repeat of what I just went over. That's our reserve values. Okay, so now here they are side by side. Okay, so now we've got them side by side. We're gonna do the next, we're gonna take the next step here. Okay, no hypothesis, no association. Alternative hypothesis, there is an association. Okay, so how are we gonna compare those two? Well, if if there were, if we happened to, if in fact there's no association, we would expect that uh, the expected values, the first set that we, unfortunately they're left and right, but the expected values, the first one we did. We would expect 10 here and 10 here, but we have 15 instead, right? One of the things that Levi said, mentioned was, if the expected values, if this is really true that there's no association, and we went and randomly selected 200 people, and we got exactly 10, 40, 30, and 120 in here, you'd start to wonder whether or not the guy faked the data. Right? It's so perfect that you wouldn't expect it to be that perfect. You'd expect a little bit of a difference, right? But not an enormous difference, right? So we wanna see if this difference is big enough for us to say that this, this difference didn't occur by chance. It's, it's really different because the expected values are different than the chose values. Okay, so there's our null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say, let's quantify, let's to get, create a method for us to estimate how different are these two. The more different that they are, the easier it is for us to say that we can reject the null hypothesis, right? In other words, if this had come out, instead of 15, if this had come out five out of 50, and this, uh, excuse me, if this had come out 40 out of 50, and this come out five out of 150, you say, oh, wow, the difference is so big. It's obvious that, that IV drug use is associated with this. But now, you know, we're kind of in between here, you know, 15 out of 50, it's a little different. Is it different enough? So we need to quantify different enough, right? So the way we're gonna do that is the simplest way is I'm gonna say to myself, I'm gonna just look at the difference between the observed values and the expected values. Like for instance, observed values is 15 for this, this square and 10 for this square, this, the same square in the other table. 15 minus 10, it's five, the difference is five. Okay, then I'm gonna say 35 minus 40, the difference there is negative five. 25 minus 30 is um, negative five. 125 minus 120 is plus five. I'm gonna add up all the differences, they all cancel out, it gets zero. No good, that's not gonna help, me, right? So when we have a problem like that in statistics, how do we resolve that? We either use the absolute value, ignore the sign, or more often than not, we wind up squaring the numbers that we got, the differences, just like we do with the squaring the sum of the squares, right? When we work with sum of the squares. So instead, I'm going to take the observed values and I'm going to subtract it from the expected values. 15 minus 10 is 5, right? So I'm going to square that number, 25. 35 minus 40 is minus 5, but I'm going to square that, so now it's a plus 25. And similarly, 25 minus 30 squared is plus 25. And 125 minus 120 is squared, uh, by the difference is five, square that, 
So it's 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25. The total differences is 100. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, more, the larger the differences are, the square differences are, the more likely it is that you can reject the null hypothesis without being wrong. You want them to be different. So a little difference, it, it, it's kind of hard to tell, but if it's a big difference, uh, it helps you out. So that comes out, this value that I'm talking about now is called chi-square. Okay, and chi-square is equal to the observed values minus the expected value for each one of those squares, squared, each one of them, so it's, but now, now that I've done that, they're 25 and 25 and 25 and 25, I've squared all of those numbers. So now I want to bring those numbers back down into the magnitude of the original numbers. So one of the things I could do is take a square root, right? Well, instead of that, what we're going to do is we're going to use the expected values. So for each one of those squares, we're going to take the observed value minus the expected value. We're going to square it, 25. And then we're going to divide by the expected value for that square. Okay. So how does that work now? We're going to do this with four squares. So chi square is equal to the observed value for box one, the upper left-hand corner, minus the expected value squared over the expected value. What was that? That was, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to see if I can't get this right. That was um, observed value was 15 minus 10 is 5, squared is 25, and the expected value was 10. So that's 25 over 10, it's two and a half, right? Does that sound right to you? And then we're gonna do that for each one of those boxes, and we're gonna add these all together. See that's, that um, formula that you just saw on the, during the lecture? That's that formula. It's just for each box, that's the summation. For each box, you're gonna do that exercise, and then you're gonna add them all together, summation. Right, that's chi square. Okay, so we're going to do it here. 15 minus 10, 25 over 10, that's two and a half. Then uh, um, uh, minus five squared is five, uh, is 25 um, uh, over 40 is 0.625. Uh, the dots, so on and so forth. 25 minus 30 is five squared is 25 over 30. Uh, remember the, ex the expected value of 30 is 0.83 plus um, uh, 125 minus 120 squared or 120 is uh, uh, 25 over 120 is 0 0.28208. And that comes up with a chi-square value of 4.16. Okay, great. Now we can see that number is 4.16. If the differences had been bigger in the two tables, we've gotten bigger number than 4.16. If the differences were less, we got a smaller number. Bigger differences, better for us, right? So what do I do now? I take my chi-square that I calculated and I have to compare it to a value that would only come up less than 5% of the time if I would be wrong in rejecting the null hypothesis. In other words, if there's no, no association, I get that big a number or bigger, right? So I need something that's gonna tell me what is the critical value of chi-squared that I can use here to determine whether 4.16 is big enough. Well, when I look up critical values, I'm always concerned about degrees of freedom. And you might have noticed in the lecture, Levi, Levi had mentioned that the degrees of freedom for this analysis is the number of rows minus one, right? Plus uh, uh, times the number of columns minus one. Two rows, two columns. Two minus one, one. Two minus one is one. Both times together, you get one. One degree of freedom, right? Yeah. So now I got to go to my table. Okay, my table, it represents this distribution. Okay, and it starts at zero and goes up. So you can't get less than zero change, right? So it starts at zero. So now notice, it's very unlikely that, the, the, that even if there's no associate, this is what it looks like, the chi-square that you would expect to get if there's no association, right? So you would expect to get a chi-square that's close to, you know, close to no difference, zero, right? But, you know, that's not very likely to happen. So the probability is very low, but you would expect a small difference, small chi-square, somewhere in this range. So this might be one over here. This might be two over here. This might be three over here and so on. But you would not expect to get a value as high as, for one degree of freedom, you wouldn't expect to get a value as high as uh, 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 four, unless there were less than 5% chance of getting it if there was no association. That means you would be down at this end of the uh, chi-square distribution. 
Well, you know, you, you have this you have this chart that describes the distribution, but the real issue here is is that is are you far enough down here? Is your chi square far enough down that what that's what's left here is five five percent chance of getting that extreme value when when they, they there is no association. So we need a table for that. I wonder if I have a table for that. I do have a table here for that. And here's the chi square table. In fact, if you I think I have it on Blackboard, if you take a look there. Oops. Hey. Let's see if I can find it. Here's the actual table itself. It, you have it on Blackboard also. Okay, but I'm showing, I'll show it to you here. Come on, open up. A little forky here. There you go. Here's the chi square table. Okay, let's take a look at this. How many degrees of freedom do we say for a two by two table? One degree of freedom. So degrees of freedom, we're going to use this chart. So for a probability of exceeding the critical value, uh, if uh, there was no association, is 5%, then the chi-square would have to be larger at, at or larger than 3.84. That's my critical value of chi-square. Let me go back to my analysis. Did I exceed my critical value of, of uh, for chi-square in this analysis? Critical value is 3.8, what was it, 84, 3.84, right? Did I exceed it? Yes. So that means there's less than a 5% chance I would get this big a number for chi-square if the null hypothesis were true. So what can I do with the null hypothesis? You can reject it and accept the alternative hypothesis. There is an association. It's that simple. I would love to tell you it's more complicated than that. I can add stuff to this. Levi I already gave you three other tests that are kind of like this. We can make it more complicated if you want it, but that's really what the chi-square test is. A couple of caveats here. One caveat is, is that you need to have values, especially in the expected values, you need to have values that are, uh, I'm sorry, observed values. You need to have at least five people in each one of these squares, right? Five subjects in each one of these squares, okay? And uh, if you don't have five people in each one of these squares, you probably should do IV. You'll see in SPSS is a selection for Yates uh, 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 method and then selection for continuity correction and so on and so forth. Continuity correction is a little bit weird. I'll tell you what that is. And then you, you probably would only, uh, you would only use it for a two by two table and only if you had less than five people. And most likely if you had less than five people in one of these squares. What is the continuity correction? Do you notice that when I said, uh, uh, um, if I, I started with expected values that were nice even numbers, right? You don't have expected value. You, you're not starting with expected values. You are starting with just the data itself. Let me see if I can give you an example of that. You don't start with the expected values. When you do it, you start with the observed values because that's what you know. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. I'll do it this way. Okay, it's working. Yeah, looks like it's working. Okay. Okay, so observe values. Okay, I'm going to take this, I'm going to do it and say that, for instance. Okay, I'm going to say that this is IV drug use. This is no IV drug use. This is HIV positive. This is HIV negative. Okay, let's say you, you survey these, uh, these people and you find that you have um, uh, 60 IV drug users. You have uh, uh, 210 people who are not IV drug users. You have, um, uh, out of the 60 people that are IV drug users, 30 are HIV positive, 30 are not. Out of the people that are IV, uh, not IV drug users, you have uh, uh, 40 and 170 who are not. What's the prevalence? 
for, for HIV, for, I'm sorry, what's the prevalence in this situation for being HIV positive? What is that prevalence? That prevalence is either 70 and there's 200. There's a total of 270 people that we've sampled. 70 of them are HIV positive. So the prevalence is equal to 70 over 200, right? Which is, let's calculate that. It's kind of, you know, I, I'll just go ahead and do it because it's hard for me to hear you from people. What was that? 35, 35 what was that? 35%, right? This is, I really didn't need this for that, did I? Let me get this out of the way. Okay, it's equal to 35%. Yeah, I should have seen that. Okay, it's equal to 35%. Okay, so now I'm going to create my expected values. This is usually the way you're going to run into this. You're not going to start with expected values. You're going to start with the real facts and then say to yourself, well, if I didn't, if there was no association, what would I expect this to be? IV positive, IV negative, uh, HIV positive, and HIV negative. What would I expect here? Well, the prevalence is stuff. I know there's 60 people. Who are, uh, who are IV drug users, and there are 210 people who are not IV drug users. 35% of 60 is how much? I could use it there. Thirty-five. Oh, clear, 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 clear. 60 times 0.35 comes out to an even number. I'm not living right. <laughs> I, I have to change that. Hang on a second. I'm going to make it uh, uh, 210, and I'm going to make this 280. And this is going to be this is going to be. Uh, 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 let's see. Hang on a second. I got uh, I got this wrong here. 210. I'm going to make this 180 and 220. Right. Does that work? That works. I think. 70, yeah, that works. What's the prevalence now? 70 over 210. 0.36? No, it's not 0.25, is it? Oh, God, again. Jeez. I'm going to have to, I'm going to really have to go weird here. You'll see why I'm doing this in a second. Uh, okay, 0.25, 25%. .25%. Actually, this might work for me. Okay, say 25%, 25%. Okay, so 25% of 60 is 15, right? Okay, 25% of 220 is how much? That's again, I can't know, it won't work. Damn. Okay, I gotta go to something that's really not a round number. I'm gonna say 200 and I'm gonna make this 210, I'm gonna make this 211 and 281 and make this 181. Okay, good. That's, I think we're working now. So what is, what is 70 out of 281? Seventy divided by 281. Okay, is 0 0.249. 0 0.249. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in memory and I'm gonna clear this. And and let's see. So 0.249. So what I what would I expect in this first box on top? Well, I would expect that is 60 people, 60 times, and recall that number. I would expect 14.9 people to be in this top box. Oops. 14.9. And that leaves in the box next to it, that's going to leave. Uh, 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 that's gonna that's gonna mean out of sixty, that's gonna be twenty. Oh wait, wait, thirty, forty. I can't read. I, the problem is I can't read that. What was that? That was fourteen point nine. Fourteen point nine. Okay, out of sixty, it'd be forty five. Forty five point one. Okay, what do you notice here? You notice that almost always, in fact, always, your observed values are always going to be integers, right? Your expected values are almost always 
if you do it legitimately, are almost always not going to be integers, right? So that's kind of weird, right? Because we said observed minus expected. So the problem is, is that our, you know, uh, uh, in order to make up for that, what we we'll, what we do is we say observed minus expected minus 0.5 squared to make up for the fact that there, one of these is always going to be integer. In other words, this can never be, even if 14.9 is what it should be, it can't be 14.9, even if, even if there's no association, it's either going to be 14 or 15, right? Even, you know, so it can't, you can never have the observed values exactly match the expected values because the observed values can only be integers and expected values can be something else. So it can't always be exactly the same. So you can make up for that, 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 that gap where you could be going lower or higher than the real value when you're looking at the observed values. So you do that by subtracting 0.5 from the observed minus expected before you square it and then put it over the expected for each one of these, right? Okay, and what you're doing is you're correcting for the fact that the observed values are not continuous. They're, they're quantum, you know, 30, 31, 32, right? So you're correcting for that. This is called the, uh, the continuity correction. Am I going to give you a situation where you're going to need to use that? No, don't worry about it. We're going to work with chi-square, even with two by two table. We'll just work with a standard version of the chi-square formula, which is called Pearson's chi-square. Okay, you'll see that name come up when we do the analysis. Okay, so if you didn't understand this, it's not that important. Just keep in mind that there's certain conditions where we might make adjustments to that simple formula that we use for chi-square. Okay, let's go back to this. So now I'm going to go back to that same table. And I'm going to copy it. And I may need a little help guys on this since you're looking at it. Okay. This is my observed values. These are my expected values. Observed. And expected. And this is uh, IV positive, IV negative, HIV positive, HIV negative. This is the same thing, HIV negative, HIV uh, positive, rather, positive, HIV negative. This is going to be IV positive, IV negative. Okay, so our expected values before were 10 and anybody remember what was that 50 no 10 Did I have that right i think i closed it i think unfortunately let me open it again okay 10 and 40 15 and 50. I put it back. 10 and 40. Am I right about that? 10 and 40, 31, 20. Oh, crap. I did put the wrong one in there. I did it wrong already. Okay. 10, 30, 40, 120. Oh, I don't see I have it done. 10, 30, 50, 120. Okay, so this is 60. This is uh, 150 for a total of, is this 40? This must have been 40, right? Total of 200. 40 and 160. Okay, and the observed values were, I think, 15, 25, uh, 35, and 120. So those are my observed values. And the total here was, it's going to be 50 and 150 again, 
because we already know that that's the number of people that are HIV positive, HIV negative, that were exposed or unexposed. Okay, so chi-square is one way I can evaluate this. Let's take another look at how we can evaluate this. Let's compare the risk of whether a person is an IV drug user to whether or not they are HIV positive. Let's calculate their risk. Out of how many people were IV drug users? 50 were IV drug users. How many of them were HIV positive? 15 of them. So what's the risk of, them, of being HIV positive if you're a drug user? The risk is 15 out of 50, right? So what is that? The risk that you're an IV drug user is 30%, 0.3. Right, 0.30. Everybody agree with that? What's the risk of being IV, HIV positive in this population if you're not an IV drug user? Well, the risk is equal to, let's see, what is it equal to? It's equal to 25 out of 150 non-IV drug users. Well, how much is that? That is one-sixth, which is, uh, 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 how much is that? That's point. 0.163.1667.1667, somewhere in there, 0.167, I'll call it 0.167. I got that right, right? Okay. Okay, that's the risk if you're not an IV drug user, right? Well, how do we get the risk? Number of people in that exposure group that were HIV positive, that's their risk, right? You wanna know something? The risk for people who are HIV positive is higher than the risk is for people who are not HIV, not IV drug users. If you're an IV drug user, you have 30% chance of being, uh, being HIV positive, that's your risk. If you're not an IV drug user, your risk is 16 or 17% chance. You wanna know something? I'm gonna put these together. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call this risk ratio. Another name for this is called relative risk. Both are, conveniently both are on. Right, relative risk or risk ratio. What I'm going to say is, I'm going to put the risk for being uh, HIV positive, uh, if you're an IV drug user, 30%, divided by the risk if you're not an IV drug user, which is 0.167. What does that come out to? That comes out to, uh, let's say, one point. Anybody want to do it for me? Got to yell it out. 1.79. So you are 1.79 times as likely to be HIV positive in this population if you use IV drug use. Isn't that a great way to describe this? And you see this all the time. Oh, smoking, you smoke, it's five times the greater chance of getting lung cancer. You expose your asbestos, asbestos, it's seven times the chance of having lung cancer. If you had both of them, then 35 times the chance, right? It's a good way to express risk between exposure or not, no exposure. It's called relative risk. Now, let me ask about you. What, now, let me ask you this. What if there were, if this were association, if there were no association between IV drug use and uh, IV drug use and being HIV positive, what would you expect the relative risk to be? How much? One, you'd expect the number on top, number on the bottom, you'd say the risk of 30% people get here, if they're already dead, 30% if they're not, or 10% or 10, and so on and so forth. You'd expect the two risks to be the same, but there's the top and the bottom the same, it's equal to one. So there's our no hypothesis. The relative risk is equal to one. Our alternative hypothesis is the relative risk is not equal to one, right? If it's not equal to one, if we can prove less than 5% chance of being wrong, that it's not equal to one, we can say, just like with the chi-square number being big, we can say with the relative risk that we're 95% sure that uh, there is an association and we can reject the null hypothesis that the risk is the same, the risk is equal, risk ratio is equal to one. That's great. The only problem is, is that you need more information than just that. And it's a little complicated to calculate. What do you need when you calculate the relative risk, instead of getting just a number, that number is not good enough. What else do I need to reject the null hypothesis with? Not just the number 
the, the point value I calculated, I need a range. What range? We need a 95% confidence interval for the relative risk. Uh, we're not going to ask you to calculate that. We're going to you can calculate that using SPSS. Okay, so you need to know what's the what's the 95% confidence interval. And if the 95% confidence interval for the relative risk is, let's say the the uh, margin of error is 0.5, that would make the relative risk 1.29 to uh, 2.29, uh, uh, something like that, right? Okay. That confidence interval does not contain the number one. So you can say with 95% certainty that the relative risk is different than one, which means you can reject the null hypothesis. Right? That's how we can use the relative risk. Okay. Now, the only thing is most statisticians, for a number of reasons that uh, uh, Levi pointed out, most of them more complicated than we need to deal with right now. Right. Most statisticians, most studies, they like to use the odds ratio. There's a few reasons for that. It's a little, it, and small, small studies, it tends to increase the uh, odds ratio, make it a little easier, and so on. There's a lot, but there's also a lot of issues in terms of like how you can manipulate it so that you can compare different, you can flop the exposure, flop the exposure and the outcome, and so on. There's a lot of a lot of things you can do with the odds ratio that that we're not worried about for right now, but we, it is used very widely and we need to understand it. So what's the odds ratio? And how does that compare with the relative risk? In a way, it's kind of the same thing. In other ways, it's, but technically, it's not exactly the same thing. How many of you guys have ever got to do track? Am I going to Yes, yeah, somebody admit to it, right? A couple of people will admit to it. When you go to the track, you put down a bet, right? Put down $2 or something like that. And you watch the tote board, the big thing on this, the big screen over there, and you see the odds change. Odds, odds, not risk, odds, right? And the odds change. And you'll see like odds, so I hope this horse is three to one. This horse is seven to one. This horse is, is uh, uh, three to two. And so uh, it was really odd, but it's almost a favor, it's sort of favor, it's kind of like, it's weird like that. But a long shot might be uh, 25 to one. Well, what does that mean, really? Those odds mean that if the, four, if the race were run, let's say five to one, if the race were run six times, that horse is expected to lose five times. That's what odds of five to one mean. Five times it loses, one times it wins. A little bit different than percent than prevalence, right? A little bit different than risk, right? That's the way odds work. Why do they do that that way? Because it's easy to calculate your winnings. For every dollar you bet, you get $5 if the horse wins, right, and so on. So it's easier to calculate the actual winnings from, from, from doing that calculation, and that's what everybody's concerned about at the track. They don't care about preference or risk and so on and so forth, right? So how do we apply that here? Okay, well, instead of, instead of as before, just like before, I wonder if I can easily, I wonder if this will work. Uh, let's, I don't remember how to erase here. Oh, I think I just pushed the button. Yeah, no. Nope, that's not working. Well, maybe the back. Nope, that's not working either. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move this over. Okay, so now I'm going to calculate something called the odds ratio instead. When I calculated the risk ratio, I took 15 over. 50 and use that for the risk. Okay. Now, instead, I'm interested in the odds, right? Well, out of 50 people, 15 had HIV, were HIV positive among the drug users. 35 were not HIV positive, right? So the odds of being HIV positive if you're an IV drug user is equal to 15 over 35. See the difference there? Instead of 15 over 50, it's 15 over 35. What does that come out to? Anybody want to tell me what that comes out to? 15 over that. So I don't think it's that even, right? I'm not going to feel foolish for asking now, right? It's not an even number. Is it? 15 out of 35? I should get to, you know, I got a calculator over here that somebody left behind. How much? Point, 
four, I'm gonna call it 0.43, okay? What are the odds for people who are not HIV positive? Well, that's gonna be 25 over what? 120, right? Risk would have been 25 over 150. Now this is odds over 25 over 120. What does that come out to be? That I should be able to do, right? That's right. 0.21? Okay, so what's the odds ratio? The odds ratio is just the odds of if you're, HIV, if you're an IV drug user of, of being uh, HIV positive over the odds if you're not, just the same way we use relative risk. That's going to be 0.43 over 0.21, and that's equal to 2 point, and I'm going to just, just kind of like wing it and say 2.1. What was the relative risk? 1.79. What's the odds ratio? 2.1. The odds of being HIV positive if you're an IV drug user, is 2.5, 2.1 times that of if you're not an IV drug user, right? The relative risk is 1.7. It's kind of the same thing. It's always going to be in the same ballpark. In a large study with big numbers, the numbers are going to be very close. In a smaller study like this with small numbers, the odds ratio and the relative risk might be a little bit different. Again, is that 2.1 enough for me to reject the null hypothesis that the odds for both of them are the same? For both groups are the same, the drug users are not. Is that, is that enough for me to reject the null hypothesis? What else do I need to know besides that 2.1? I need the confidence interval for that 2.1. So if that confidence interval turns out to be 0.95 to 3.7, can I reject the null hypothesis? Where is one? One is inside that range. It's possible that it could be one, right? So I can only reject the null hypothesis if there's less than 5% chance, 95% confidence, less than 5% chance that it would be the same number, it would, would be in that range, right? So if one is inside that 95% confidence interval, I can't say that the that the odds are different than one for these two groups. The odds ratio is different than one. If one is outside of that confidence interval, I can say I'm 95% sure, it less than 5% chance to be wrong, that the odds are different for these two groups. So we need to see that confidence interval. Again, the chi-square calculation is very simple, very easy to do. But the odds ratio uh, and relative risk, very easy to do also, but then the confidence interval is the confidence interval for those relatives is a little bit more difficult. Not impossible, remember, because it's just, these are just proportions. So remember, we did confidence interval for proportions, but there's two of them, and it, it can get a little messy, so you're probably better off sticking with SPSS calculation. Yes? I didn't, I made them up in my head. We're going we're gonna to use SPSS to actually calculate it, yes. In this situation, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. It, exactly. We have an excluded one as a possibility. Yes, exactly right. Okay. This is not, it seems not that complicated. And this is great because you can use these tests with any categorical data. Now, it is also possible if you want that. Okay. Let me just try this. It's also possible you could use also use this. Okay, so I'm gonna say, uh, let's say lung cancer. Lung cancer positive, lung cancer negative, right? Except now I'm gonna say um, uh, never smoked. Um, uh, a, pa a, a quit a past smoker or uh, still smoke or a smoker. Someone who smoked a pen. So now I got three exposures here. And I got, uh, I got uh, uh, outcomes from lung cancer, no, no, no lung cancer. Um, and we can do the same thing we did before. Let's say it turns out when we do our survey that we got 50 people in here and 100 people in here and uh, we have 200 people in here 
And uh, it turns out that 10 out here, uh, 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 five here, and uh, seven here. And it turns out we have 12, 22, and this is uh, two, 300, 350, 350. And this is the difference, 320, 328, right? This is the difference. The prevalence is 22 over 350. We can calculate our prevalence. From that, we can make up a expected values table. What will we expect these numbers to be? Right? And we can do chi-square, we can do odds ratio, and so on and so forth, right? But when we do chi-square, what do you notice here? What kind of table is this? What's the difference here? It's no longer a two by two table, right? You can do this with chi-square. The only difference is the observed minus expected square divided by expected for each of the boxes. Instead of four numbers, you're gonna have six numbers you're gonna to add together. That's gonna make the chi-square value bigger. And what does that mean in terms of your critical value of chi-square? It's gonna be bigger. So now it's three minus, three minus one is two. One, two minus one is one. Two times one is two, two degrees of freedom. So now your critical value of chi-square is 5.6, basically, instead of 3.84. So that's how you decide whether to reject an all hypothesis. Well, how about odds ratio? Can you do an odds ratio on a three by, a three by two table or a two by three or four by seven? You can only do an odds ratio, two by two table. Right? That there's ways around this. Like for instance, you could say, I'm gonna do two separate calculations for odds ratio. One for, I'm gonna break this out and do one table for uh, past smokers and never smoked, and then a separate table for smokers and never smoked. Compare them separately within two by two tables. So if you're really slick and you want to do that, but for the most part, if you put this in SPSS, it will do the chi-square for you, but it'll tell you that like, uh, I'm only going to do it if you give me a two by two table to work with. And the, no, the columns are two, two minus one is one. What about the rows? Two times one, two. Okay, so that's only two degrees of freedom. Any questions on this so far? Okay, not too bad, right? Not terrible. Right? Let's apply this. Yes. We're gonna we're gonna do that right now. Okay, we're actually gonna do that right now. So I'm gonna pull up some data here, and I, I, there's a lot more stuff on Blackboard that I've given you, including I think I see even some some links to to uh, past sessions that we've recorded that maybe I haven't made, screwed up the calculations quite as much, but probably not. I probably do it all the time anyway. Okay, so you also you have other, you have PDF files where I've demonstrated this as well. Okay, so let me get, let me get one of these uh, data sets and I'm gonna take something, let's see what this is here. Okay, some of these really goofy data sets, but they're, they're, they're simple, so they're easy to use. Of course, most of this stuff is just made up anyway. Okay, so here's a study, if it ever comes up, where we are examining whether smoking status, let me see what this is. Gender, smoking status, let me get a good look, see if I have. Yep, these are three categorical variables. Smoking status, disease, which is the presence of aortic stenosis, right? And uh, gender, aortic stenosis is, that's like hardening of the arteries, right? Clogged arteries, I think. I think I've heard of the definition. But um, so aortic stenosis, right? And let's see what these, how these are, are coded. So uh, 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 smoking status is yes or no. One or two, yes or no. Okay. Uh, what about disease? Disease is yes, it's present, or no, it isn't present. Uh, what about gender? Okay, uh, one is, uh, zero is female, one is male. Okay, that's the way this is coded. If I go back into the data view, you'll see that there is, if I change this so you can view the value labels, you can see the different pieces. So each one of these is an individual. This person it is a non smoker, uh, does not have the disease, and is male. Uh, this person 
is non-smoker, has uh, aortic stenosis, and is female. And I see each one of these cases, the rows are cases here, right? So we want to examine whether or not there's an association, say, between gender and aortic stenosis in this random sample from this population, fake random sample. Right. So how am I going to how am I going to analyze this? I'm going to go to analyze, and chi square and odds ratio are hidden under descriptive statistics, right? And it's hidden even further in something called cross tabs, right? The table, these tables, these contingents, what I call contingents and tables, are also called cross tabs. Right? So I'm going to click on add descriptive statistics cross tabs. I'm going to click on this, and it comes up and it asks me, what do you want to put in the rows? What do you want to put in the columns? So I'm going to put the exposure in the rows and the disease, the outcome in the columns. So the exposure I'm going to look at first is gender. I'm going to move that into the rows. And the, the outcome is the presence of aortic stenosis. I'm going to put that in the columns. And then I'm going to, uh, let's see. Okay, nope, don't worry about that. Okay, in this, in this statistics, right, I can ask it first to do, an, I can ask it to do a number of things. And I can ask it to do chi-square. I can ask it to do risk. Risk is going to mean risk and odds ratio. I can ask it to do those various calculations. You want to know something? I'm not going to ask it to do any of that. First, I'm going to go into cells. And I'm going to tell it I want to see, I want you to make me a table of the observed values, and uh, uh, show me, show me uh, this table by observed values. And you know, give me the percentages by rows at the same time. I'm going to click OK. It's going to open an output window, I think. Did I click OK? There we go. There we go. And here's my output. And if you look at my output, hopefully you can see this. You have this open on your desk. It's a little bit easier. No easy way for me to increase the size of this. Okay, let's see. Females out of out of 215 subjects in this sample, 109 were females, 106 were males. Of the 109 females, 36 had aortic stenosis. Out of the uh, 200, uh, out of the 106 males, 62 males had aortic stenosis. Right? So we have uh, uh, we have a. This is our table. And notice it calculated the percentages by rows. So 33% of the females had uh, aortic stenosis, while this is obviously a population that's at high risk. 58% uh, of the males had aortic stenosis. That's my risk for each one of those things. That 58% is 62 out of 106, 58%. So now, what's my relative risk for females versus males? My relative risk is 33% divided by 58%. 33% divided by 58%. Gee, that's like about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. That's less than one. Remember when we talked about smoking and, and lung cancer, we talked about uh, HIV status and, uh, and, and drug use, right? This number was a multiplier by two or three or four. This is, less. This is 0 0.6. What does that tell you about gender and aortic stenosis. That tells you that being female is, puts you at lower risk, it's protective. That's why the risk ratio is coming out smaller. Right? So now let's actually, just so you can see that, let's actually calculate chi-square here. And how are we gonna calculate chi-square? Well, like SPSS now is gonna calculate, gonna create a, a from our observed table, it's now going to calculate an expected table and actually do the calculation. So I'm going to go up here to analyze again, descriptive statistics, cross tabs. Let's see how I'm doing it right here. Uh, cross tabs, and I'm going to go into cross tabs, and I'm going to say, okay, in cells, I'm going to say, uh, get rid of that uh, percentage stuff over there. Just show me the observed values and the expected values. Okay, and I'm going to do this again. And let's look at the table that we wind up with. And the table we wind up with only shows the uh, uh, observed values, which is they call count 36, the expected values 49.7, uh, so on and so forth. It doesn't, it, it actually displays it as one table with two values, observed and expected, instead of two separate tables. But it calculates both of them. Since it calculated both of them, now you can go back 
You don't have to do it one step at a time. I'm only doing it to show you how you can build up on this. Cross tabs. I can go back in here and I can go into statistics and tell it now, calculate the chi-square value. I can also say continue. And SPSS will calculate the chi-square value for us. And here we go. The chi-square, Pearson's chi-square value is 14.04. Okay, 14.04. Okay, good. But, well, if you use the continuity correction, which is a little bit more conservative, comes out to a little bit smaller number, is 13.09. But how many degrees of freedom is this? One, right? Two by two k for one degree of freedom. What was the critical value for chi square for one degree of freedom? 3.84. And we got 14. So what do you think about this? We're going to be able to reject it on hypothesis. Not only does it give you that value, but it tells you the probability of getting this extreme of value if the null hypothesis is true. And again, it's 0 0.000. It's not really zero. It's less than 0 0.001. So it puts it 0 0.000 in there. So this tells us we can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. There is an association between gender and uh, uh, whether or not you're, you're at risk for aortic stenosis, right? Now, let's go further. Let's go back up here to analyze descriptive statistics cross tabs, and this time I'm going to go into statistics, and I'm going to check off risk. I'm going to do it again, and it calculates my chi-square again, right? There's my chi-square table again. And then if you go further down here, odds ratio for gender, female versus male, is 0.35. Oh, wow, 0.35. It calculated the odds ratio for me. It also calculates the, uh, the uh, relative risk for me. Remember I said it was about 0.6? It calculates it exactly, and it's really 0 0.56, 0 0.56, right? So that second number is the relative risk. They kind of use a different phrase for it, but that's the relative risk. The first number is the odds ratio, okay? Now, in order to reject the null hypothesis, what is our null hypothesis where odds ratio is concerned? Odds ratio, null hypothesis, odds ratio is equal to one means there's no difference in the odds for either group, for male or females. Our alternative hypothesis, odds ratio is not equal to one. And what do we need to have besides the actual odds ratio itself in order to be sure we can reject the null hypothesis, the odds ratio is equal to one, we need the 95% confidence interval. Here it is. So the odds ratio is 0.35. The 95% confidence interval is 0 0.2, 0 0.20, to 0 0.61. What's not in there? One, so we can reject the null hypothesis. We're 95% sure it's not one, right? So, so um, uh, you could flip this and put the males on the top row, so it would come up the inverse of, uh, uh, of 0.56. It right? might be a little bit more interesting that way. But at any rate, uh, you can see what happened here. And I'm going to do the same thing now with smoking status. Okay, and let's go analyze, descriptive statistics, cross tabs. And I'm gonna move gender out of here. And I'm gonna move smoking status in. And I'm gonna leave everything else the same. I'm gonna say, okay. Okay, let's see what we got here. Let's see. We have, here's our table. Smoking status, yes. Smoking status, no. So on and so forth. Chi-square came out to be 9.48. Again, I can reject the null hypothesis because it's greater than my critical value, but also because it, it, I don't even need to worry about that because it told me that the probability of getting this extreme of value, my significance, is 0 0.002. Notice it says two-sided there. Levi and I have never been able to figure out why they say two-sided there, because chi-square is always a one-sided test. We're only worried about this end, right? So I don't know why, you know, Bill Gates has not answered any of my emails about this. So, well, actually not Bill Gates, IBM has not answered any of my emails about this. So. I don't know why they say that. But okay, what about odds ratio? Okay, well here, the odds ratio for smoking, yes or no, is 2.363. Uh, so you're 2.4 times as likely, uh, your odds are 2.3 times as greater if you're a smoker versus if you're not smoker. And what about, um, uh, what about for, um, uh, uh, what, am I, what about my relative risk? Well, my relative risk is 1.6. Right, and again, relative risk odds ratio. You got to look at the confidence interval. Confidence interval for odds ratio is 1.36 to 4.110. 1, 
one's not between you rejecting on hypothesis. 1.17 to 2.18, again, you would expect all of these to agree, right? Chi-square, the odds ratio is relative, they should all agree that you can reject an null hypothesis and they're all based on the same numbers. Okay, so you can reject the null hypothesis for this as well. Now, if I do have, let me see if I have uh, one that's, uh, uh, that has more than this number of variables. Okay, no, let me get, I don't want to close that yet. Okay, let's open this one. Let's open, this is North Carolina birth data, 800, uh, sample 800 North births in North Carolina. And I'm going to do this real fast so I can just talk about the project for five minutes. If SPSS lets me talk about that. There we go. There we go. Okay. okay, yes. Yeah, I agree. Whatever it is, I agree. Okay. Oh, what did I just do? Can I make a mistake here? No. Okay. okay, so let's see what I got here in the way of data. Okay, marry, marital status. I want to go to my variable view and I need to find something. Uh, marital status, no birth rate. One of marital status. Nope, that's only two. Okay, I'll use ethnicity. Race of the mother, this, this two. Oh, okay, I'm gonna use the race of the mother. Okay, here is a categorical variable, uh, race of mom, race mom, uh, categorical variable. There's a lot of categories here, right? Look at them, there's, there's uh, values. There's eight different values for the mother's race. And I'm going to see if there's an association between the race of the mother and whether or not the infant was born premature. And what zero means it was not premature, one means it was premature. So I'm gonna do analyze, descriptive statistics, cross tabs, and I'm going to put in the uh, race of the mother into the rows, that's our exposure, and the outcome is whether or not the, the uh, infant was premature, okay? And I'm gonna ask it to calculate the chi-square value and the risk, meaning the odds ratio as well. And it's not happy about, so I put this into the wrong spot. Okay. So what we get? Okay, where'd it go? Okay, did I get it? Here we go, here's the chi-square value. And it's five degrees of freedom. Why is it five degrees of freedom? Because there were seven rows minus uh, five, six rows. Minus one, I guess six times two rows and two columns, minus one is five times one. Okay, so that's number of degrees of freedom. And it came out with a Pearson's chi-square value of 10.821. Well, now that's interesting, but since we have so many more cells, the chi-square value just by its nature is gonna be a bigger number, even if there's no association. So we have to look at the significance the significance is 0 0.055. The p-value is significant. The probability of getting this outcome if there's no association between ethnicity and uh, premature birth and the uh, for, for all of these, right, uh, is 0 0.055. Is that less than 5%? No, it's not. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis. Well, how does our odds ratio look? Here's our odds ratio. Uh-oh, risk estimate statistics cannot be computed. They're only computed with a two-by-two two table. So it's sorry now, it's not a two by two table, I'm not gonna calculate it. Simplify this to a two by two table if you want to argue calculate it. So you could take two ethnicities and compare them for uh, out birth outcome, premature or not premature. And you could, you know, like, uh, you could create new variables, you know, that move over only to the ethnicity. 